Starship's final round of pre-launch tests is progressing rapidly at Starbase. SpaceX carried out a Booster 7 Starship 24 full-stack partial fuel load test on January 18. The testing operations began at 8.37 a.m. local time with the fire extinguisher and detonation suppression system test. For those unfamiliar, the fire extinguisher and detonation suppression system is designed to purge the orbital launch mount with high-pressure nitrogen gas and water, effectively cleaning and preventing any volatile mixtures of methane and oxygen underneath the pad before engine ignition. This system is implemented to prevent incidents like the one that happened during the spin prime test of Booster 7 on July 11 last year. The chilling of fuel lines and engines began at around 11 a.m. on Wednesday, and 40 minutes later, SpaceX began pumping propellants into the methane and oxygen tanks of Booster 7. Within about 20 minutes, both tanks were filled to almost 25% of their capacity. The booster was kept in that state for the next 25 minutes, before the propellants were offloaded from the vehicle to conclude the test. Even though vigorous venting was observed from the orbital launch tower and the engine chill vent was active, no visible frost line was observed on Starship 24 during Wednesday's test. The test was very similar to the partial fuel load test that took place on January 13. The road closure notice suggests rocket testing at Starbase will resume on Monday, January 23. According to current understanding, the next major pre-launch milestone will be the full-stack wet dress rehearsal. The wet dress rehearsal test will simulate a launch day scenario, except for the ignition of the 33 Raptor V2 engines on the booster. It will involve fully loading propellants into the booster and ship, as well as providing a launch day rehearsal for the mission controllers. The date for the wet dress rehearsal test has not been announced yet. Given the potential risks associated with a fully loaded Starship, a large safety zone will be established during the test day, including the evacuation of Boca Chica Village. Propellant delivery to the storage tanks at the tank farm is in full swing. If the wet dress rehearsal is not successful on the first try, it may take several days before SpaceX attempts again due to the need to replenish the tank farm. Once the wet dress rehearsal is successfully completed, Ship 24 will be destacked for a Booster 733 engine static fire test. It will be the first time SpaceX fully tests the rocket's complex plumbing system. While Booster 7 is being prepared for the static fire test, teams can install the remaining thermal protection system tiles on Ship 24, particularly those around the attach points on its nose cone. After successfully completing the static fire test, Ship 24 will be restacked atop Booster 7, leaving only the launch license to be obtained before SpaceX can settle on a launch date. The Federal Communications Commission has once again granted a license to SpaceX for the Starship orbital test flight. But the company still requires the Federal Aviation Administration's license before the rocket can leave the ground. According to Musk, even though a March launch attempt is highly likely, SpaceX will be ready for the test flight by late February. The success of the orbital mission would provide valuable data on the accuracy of the booster's landing for future returns to the launch site. At the same time, the survival of Ship 24 until splashdown would validate its thermal protection system tiles. The Booster 7 and Ship 24 launch will be followed by the orbital flight test of Booster 9 and Ship 25. Booster 9, which had successfully completed two partial cryogenic proof tests, was brought back to the build site on January 10 for engine installation. Meanwhile, Starship 25, which had previously completed three cryoproof tests, was rolled out to the launch site on January 14 to resume pre-launch tests. Ship 25 was lifted and placed atop suborbital launch pad B on January 17, and the prototype will go through a series of static fire tests in the near future. Only two ships have thus far successfully completed six-engine static fire tests, and in both cases, it required a number of single and multi-engine static fire tests to get there. If Ship 25 foregoes those preliminary tests and jumps right into a full six-engine static fire test, it could be a sign that SpaceX is more confident in the new Starship design. During the NASA Advisory Council's virtual meeting on January 17, former NASA engineer Wayne Hale said the uncrewed SpaceX Human Landing System demonstration mission might take place this year. And in a recent tweet, Elon Musk mentioned that SpaceX aims to build up to five full-stack Starship rockets in 2023. Additionally, according to the draft programmatic environmental assessment for the Starship program released in September 2021, SpaceX plans to conduct five orbital Starship missions a year. If Musk's calculations and Hale's projection are accurate, out of the five full stacks this year, one could be an uncrewed SpaceX human landing system demo ship. But given that SpaceX has yet to conduct a Starship orbital test flight, and that the timelines for future missions will depend on the outcome of that test mission, I doubt the lunar demo mission will launch this year.
In 2022, SpaceX produced two full-stack Starships, and currently, the hardware required for at least three flight tests is already nearing completion or is just beginning pre-flight testing. If SpaceX can build five full stacks this year and complete their pre-launch tests, it would be a significant step forward for the company. Starship 27 stacking operations have already begun inside the high bay at Starbase build site. Meanwhile, Starship 22, which has been on display at the Rocket Garden for the past several months, is now being scrapped by SpaceX. After removing one of the aft flaps and the hydraulic power unit, the prototype was moved into the high bay on Tuesday evening to disassemble it in the reverse order of assembly. Super Heavy Booster 8 was moved from the Rocket Garden to the Mega Bay on Wednesday evening. On Friday morning, the prototype was cut in half, further dismantling will take place over the coming days. Only Super Heavy Booster 4, Starship Serial No. 15, and Starship 20 are now on display in the Rocket Garden. A Starlink satellite dispenser was recently installed into the payload bay section of an unfinished Starship prototype. Although not confirmed, it is believed that the Starship that received the dispenser could be shipped 29 or 30. In the last update, I mentioned SpaceX's plan to build a launch mount water deluge system at Starbase. Several manifolds were recently spotted at Kennedy Space Center ready for shipment on a barge to the Starbase. It looks like they are parts of the Starship water deluge system. Teams installed skates on the Starship launch tower at Kennedy Space Center on January 19. The skates will allow the launch tower arm carriage to slide up and down the launch tower. The carriage and tower arms have already arrived at Pad 39A and are currently being preassembled. Once the preassembly is complete, they will be installed on the orbital launch tower. Now, let's discuss some of the biggest updates in the world of science and technology from the past week. NASA engineers are troubleshooting thruster problems on the lunar flashlight CubeSat launched last month to search for water ice on the lunar surface. A SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket launched the lunar flashlight probe to the moon on December 11 alongside the Japanese Hakuto R moon lander carrying the Rashid lunar rover built by the United Arab Emirates. In a recent mission update, NASA said that while the CubeSat is largely healthy and communicating with NASA's deep space network, three of its four thrusters are underperforming or producing less thrust than expected. Based on ground testing, the mission team thinks that the underperformance might be caused by obstructions in the fuel lines that may be limiting the propellant flow to the thrusters. Lunar Flashlight uses a green fuel known as Advanced Spacecraft Energetic Non-Toxic, which is designed to be less toxic than the hydrazine propellant on most spacecraft. The spacecraft will need to perform daily trajectory correction maneuvers starting in early February to reach lunar orbit in April. NASA plans to soon operate the thrusters for much longer durations, hoping to clear out any potential thruster fuel line obstructions. In case the propulsion system can't be restored to full performance, the mission team is drawing up alternative plans to accomplish the maneuvers using the propulsion system's current reduced thrust capability. Lunar Flashlight is designed to go into a near-rectilinear halo orbit, similar to that used by the capstone CubeSat that arrived at the Moon in November and the future Lunar Gateway. The orbit will take the CubeSat as close as 15 kilometers above the surface at the South Pole, where it will use lasers to look for water ice that may exist on the surface. Please check out my previous update to learn more about the Hakuto R lunar mission. Link in the description. SpaceX successfully launched three missions to space last week. A Falcon Heavy rocket lifted off from Kennedy Space Center on January 15, kicking off a classified mission dubbed USS F-67 for the U.S. Space Force. It was the Space Force's first national security mission of 2023 and Falcon Heavy's fifth flight since its 2018 debut. The mission carried the second continuous broadcast augmenting SATCOM, a military communication satellite operated by the U.S. Space Force, along with the long-duration propulsive ESPA, a bus carrying five small military payloads into orbit. The two side boosters of the rocket successfully separated from the core stage about two and a half minutes after liftoff and landed back at the landing zones at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. It was the second landing of those two boosters, which took part in the USS F-44 Falcon Heavy mission last year. The boosters will be refurbished and reused on a third U.S. military launch called USS F-52, currently scheduled for April 10. The rocket's core stage was not recovered during the mission and was jettisoned into the Atlantic Ocean after stage separation. The stage was traveling too fast, and the mission's performance requirements did not allow enough fuel to return the stage back to Earth. Meanwhile, the rocket's upper stage deployed its payloads to the intended geosynchronous orbit. The SpaceX webcast did not show views of the second stage or the payload at the U.S. government's request.
62 hours after the Falcon Heavy mission, a Falcon 9 rocket lifted off from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station with a GPS navigation satellite owned and operated by the U.S. Space Force. Approximately two and a half minutes after liftoff, the rocket's first stage separated from the upper stage and landed on a SpaceX drone ship stationed in the Atlantic Ocean. Just over an hour and 29 minutes after liftoff, at an altitude of about 4,300 kilometers, the satellite separated from the rocket's upper stage. Over the next two weeks, the spacecraft will use its onboard thrusters to place itself into its final 20,200-kilometer circular orbit. The satellite, Global Positioning System 3 Space Vehicle 06, is the sixth spacecraft in the latest generation of GPS-3 series satellites. The 4,352-kilogram satellite, which has an expected lifetime of 15 years, is designed to provide navigation and timing signals to military and civilian users. The third SpaceX mission of the past week lifted off from Vandenberg Space Force Base on January 19, carrying 51 Starlink satellites into a low Earth orbit. The Falcon 9 first stage booster returned to Earth less than nine minutes after liftoff, landing on a SpaceX drone ship stationed in the Pacific Ocean. It was the first mission for this particular booster, and the landing marked SpaceX's 166th successful booster recovery. Meanwhile, the rocket's upper stage deployed all 51 satellites into a 570 km orbit, inclined 70 degrees to the equator. The next Falcon 9 mission, which will carry another batch of Starlink satellites into orbit, is scheduled for January 24. ABL Space Systems may have figured out what went wrong during the maiden flight of its RS-1 rocket. The company's two-stage RS-1 rocket crashed to Earth shortly after launching from Alaska's Pacific Spaceport Complex on January 10, ending its first orbital mission prematurely in a violent explosion. In a statement posted on social media on January 18, ABL stated that at around 10.87 seconds after liftoff, the rocket's first stage suffered a complete loss of power, which de-energized propellant valves, causing the nine first stage E2 engines to shut down at an altitude of 761 feet. Additionally, there was some visual evidence of fire or smoke near the vehicle quick disconnect in the engine bay after liftoff. The rocket, deprived of thrust, coasted upward for 2.63 seconds before falling, hitting the ground nearly 60 feet from where it lifted off. At the time of impact, the rocket still had about 95% of its propellant on board, creating an energetic explosion and overpressure wave that caused damage to nearby equipment and facilities. The damage included the rocket launch mount, propellant storage tanks, communications equipment, and a fabric hanger containing integration equipment. All the debris was contained within a pre-designated hazard zone, and no people were in the area at the time of impact. ABL is still investigating the failed launch under the supervision of the Federal Aviation Administration. The company did not specify when the investigation would be finished, but did state that it has already completed both stages for the second RS-1 rocket, which are ready for pre-launch testing. Thank you for joining me for this week's science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.